in the USC Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. I'm Max Schwartz. And I'm Allie Main. And the President Obama just gave his final State of the Union address, and we are here for a recap and analysis with our first political coverage of the spring semester and what will kick off our Vote 2016 political coverage. In the President's final State of the Union address, he asked, he sought to answer four questions for the American public. First, how do we give everyone a fair shot at opportunity and security in this new economy? When speaking about the economy, the President discussed job creation, affordable education, including pre-K for all, and two-year community college free, wage insurance, the Affordable Care Act, how the recklessness on Wall Street caused the financial crisis, and the need to tailor rules for workers and small businesses instead of just the Wall Street and corporations. The next question was, how do we make technology work for us and not against us, especially when it comes to solving urgent challenges like climate change? The president addressed the spirit of American innovation. He spoke about how medical research has, um, how medical research has been inspired by Americans and how he addressed a new initiative for the United States to find the cure for cancer. He said the United States should be the country to find the cure for cancer. In regards to climate change, the president said that the U.S. should produce the energy of the future and how this would be great for American businesses. Next, the, the president asked, how do we keep America safe and lead the world without becoming its policemen? President Obama said the Amer America needs to keep the world safe without becoming ice or without trying to nation build. Um, the president was very clear in saying that the United States is the most powerful country in the world. He said that Americans should not feed into Islamic State rhetoric and say that the Islamic State is a threat to the United States. Instead, he said Congress needs to vote to authorize use of military force against the Islamic State. And finally, the president asked, how can we make our politics reflect what's best in us and not what's the worst? The president said that we need to reform the political system to strengthen American democracy. He mentioned campaign finance reform, independent redistrict redistricting commissions, and to make it easier for every American's voice to be heard. And overall, I think we can both say, and as had been reported previously before the speech, that this was not going to be a legislative wish list, and it certainly wasn't. It was more a list of successes and what the United States does needs to do to the future to, to ensure a sustainable planet and sustainable country. And uh, specifically on the note of the cancer, he said, quote, let's make America the country that cures cancer once and for all. And he put Biden mission control. And as we saw once earlier in the presidency after Newtown and Biden was put in, on, in charge of all the gun control measures, he did a good job in staying on target and making sure things got done. And I imagine that that's part of the reason why the president put him on here, as he said during the speech. And I, based on his previous track record and his legislative negotiating, I'm sure he'll be able to do a good job to make sure this gets done. But what's certainly interesting is part of the, uh, when they talked about all these reforms to the National Institutes of Health and the Centers of Di for Disease Control and Prevention and about how we're going to do things for public health and eradicate diseases. One thing that was not touched upon, and I don't think, I don't think we were expecting it to, was the fact that the CDC is not and the NIH are not allowed to spend money researching the effects of and, or mass shootings and as a public, as a, I, uh, I guess as a major problem in this country and the mindset behind public shootings. Yes, and the president also in the speech when he was talking about how the United States should be a leader in world affairs rather than just going into nations and becoming like a nation builder or becoming an isolationist. Um, one of the examples he gave was how the United States should invest in or will invest to end malaria yeah, it was malaria that he wants Congress to fund, as well as AIDS, both of which are significant because it's, it's United States getting involved in a way that's not the international policeman, and he said that we're also working on eliminating poverty in that country. Uh, the, other big, the other big part of the speech uh, was the 21st century transportation system, the, um, the and, uh, of course, the big, the big thing being... Uh, Pardon me. 
the big thing being pre-K for everybody. Right. And in addition to that, he also went on about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which he wants Congress to approve, and then there's also coming up the, trans the Transatlantic Partnership. Um, and then he wants to make sure that we essentially rebuild our entire system because the system that we've established since World War II is no longer working. You're right. And in, in the 21st century transportation system, the president didn't really give specifics on that. He was more specific about, like, the new types of energy and how yeah. American businesses could... But I imagine a lot that. of it would have to do with more solar power and more wind power and less, obviously, not using fossil fuels to power our transit. No, um, possibly ethanol, which is something Ted Cruz wants to get rid of as we mm -hmm. relate this to 2016. Which, and he did take direct jobs at the candidates when he said, uh, he told, he said that we don't need tough talk and we don't need carpet bombing, which was, which was a Ted Cruz talking point, in which Ted Cruz had been, which he had featured in commercials, I believe. Um, he had also said that we don't need. Uh, what did he, what, what was his specific quote? Um, he said uh, it was tough talk, and he said we don't need calls to carpet bomb, which goes directly to Ted Cruz. And then he also he also went after Donald Trump when he cited political correctness, and what he's doing is not political correctness, and it's really not. He's just telling the truth as president of this country. Absolutely, he did go after Trump quite a few times, and he he kind of went ag we, he went after a lot of rhetoric that we've been seeing a lot in the 2016 um, Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, he said that, he said uh, about, he wants to make sure that people feel included here, that we have people go, are allowed to vote, which is a direct jab at the Republicans who have disenfranchised voters in their states, and the, the, the conservative Supreme Court that has rolled back parts of the Voting Rights Act. I think he, when he called for getting more people out to vote, he implicitly, uh, he implicitly was calling for a new Voting Rights Act. Um, he also was calling, the in the last term, the Supreme Court had allowed uh, independent redistricting commissions in every state, which is something California has, and which is part of the reason we, we have the congressional, I wouldn't say mess, but the immovable districts that we have. And so I think he, that's part of what he was calling for as well, to see more uh, vote, a voting process that is more fair. Um, he, wanted, he implied he wanted big money out of politics, and he wanted, like I said earlier, a poss possibly a change to the Voting Rights Act. The big money out of politics got a pretty large applause in that final section of his speech, including the vice president gave him a standing ovation for that part. Which he, yes. I think that may have been the only that standing ovation from Biden. He stood, from the vice president. and Paul Ryan did not seem to stand at all, whereas Boehner at least stood once or twice during previous speeches. And speaking of that, we have 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 31 times of a what I call medium length to longer applause where it continued for more than a few seconds and or people stood up. Right, and which is pretty understandable because the president was talking so much about change in the future. He was, it was, it was an uplifting tone. Are, were there any implicit overall. messages that you saw other than what we had previously, previously discussed? Um, I thought it was interesting how often he kind of he kind of went back to the past talking about the future quite a few times he talked um he talked about one part that stood out to me was when he was talking about the spirit of innovation and he talked about how um when the united states saw that the soviet union had put sputnik into space they didn't ignore it they um then he said a couple of years later, they they landed on the moon. So um, and they built the space program. I thought that was interesting because um, just the way that he addressed the United States approach to science, the scientific community. And, and that goes back to what I think he, in his advancements of STEM education, which is science, yes. technology, engineering, and math, and now STEAM, which is science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. And he has done that, and he obviously wants to do more of that. Uh, and we talked specifically about the past also when we nation building I think is part of that because he's calling against it and he called he cited Vietnam however he led the nation or he was part of the nation building in Libya and to somewhat of a lesser extent in Egypt and that hasn't gone well now right. what do you think about his energy because we had talked about this shortly after the speech did you think he would, was he as energetic as you expected him to be on his final state of the union no because you know going into it tonight there was 
a lot released about how it was going to be about the future and about, you know, just like um, speaking a little bit about what he has implemented in the past year, but just about how this would make America better in the future. And I thought the tone, although it was still oriented around those themes, I thought the tone was a little less completely energetic and optimistic as I would assume it would be. I thought it was pretty interesting, um, especially in the foreign policy segment, because he was speaking about America being, you know, the strongest country. But, you know, there's there's still so much going on every day with the Islamic State attacking mm -hmm. other countries that it's it's hard to upkeep that tone, I think, especially in that portion of the speech. Yes, and he said that men in the back of a pickup truck don't serve as a threat, but on the Islamic State, he did talk uh, along the same lines, I guess I should say. He did talk about the Iran nuclear deal, which I, was, which I found surprising, given what right. happened this afternoon where we had the Iranian military taking two small Navy vessels and ten sailors. Yeah, I was surprised. I thought that was the part of the foreign policy section of the speech that... I guess brought down the tone the most. Everything else, I think, regardless of you know like what he had thought going into the speech, and then the Iran thing happens. Um, everything else, I think, was pretty consistent, regardless of what happened today. But that was the part that was most inconsistent, I guess, with what was going on today. Yes, and obviously there were. We are in tough times in very in various parts of the world and in various in various sectors of. I guess whether it be the economy or international affairs. So it is difficult. However, I was expecting him to name people that he had in his box or at least reference the vacant seat that was left for the victims of gun violence, but none of that happened. Did that at all surprise you? Yeah, did you did you see the vacant seat? Did they show the vacant seat? I, they may I have, didn't notice They may it. have showed the it vacant seat at the beginning. It was either I believe it was either next to the first lady or in between the first lady and the and uh, Dr. Biden. But and speak, uh, he didn't. He obviously was, wasn't going to touch on gun because it was going to be politically. It would have been politically bad. But politically speaking here, and we we have to discuss this because this is an election year. He does feel bad that the, the partisanship has gotten so bad and the lack of being mm -hmm. able to work across the aisle has been so bad. And what do you think are the reasons for that? Well, he, yeah, he mentioned that that was one of the regrets of his presidency, mm -hmm. which you know you. You don't expect maybe a president to say in their, or to emphasize so much at the end of their speech. But I think um, when he was speaking about that question that you just asked me specifically, he talked, I thought the campaign finance reform was probably the biggest part of that. He talked so much about how the average American doesn't feel like they're getting their voice heard. And because that, that's because of just the large influence that money plays in politics. Oh, I think yeah. that stood out to me the most about what causes this division. Yes, and he heavily criticized Citizens United, and obviously mm -hmm. you know you're in, you have some sort of an unequal playing field when you have people who can pledge $900 million. Granted, the Koch brothers haven't done that yet, but they said they would. And on, on that note, though, it is rather interesting because some would say that he hasn't worked well with Republicans, and that's caused the division, whereas other people would say that Republicans just generally don't trust him because of his executive actions. And let's not kid ourselves, because things are originating with his race and the birther movement and everything like that, it's just, Absolutely. and especially among the far right, which he did criticize, he did criticize the Freedom Caucus and the Tatum Party implicitly during the speech. Yes, I agree. I, and then I think in, let's talk about now about Nikki Haley's response, the Absolutely. Republican. Absolutely. I think that... You know, they mentioned leading into her speech that she was a good Republican candidate to, to give this response because she's young, she's a minority, she's a daughter of immigrants. Um, so she kind of is the opposite of maybe what this continues uh, so the many of the candidates going into the 2016 election. This the continues the theme of the Republican rebuttals because last year it was... Joni Ernst, who is the senator from Iowa, she was a, she's a freshman senator, and they wanted a woman to show, to be able to show that a woman can be a Republican and that good things can happen. And here they want to step further by, by choosing a woman who's from an immigrant family. And I thought it was really interesting when she was talking about immigrants and she was talking about how uh, 
two things. One of which is she said that they had each other when they didn't have much, that meaning her family, which could possibly mean that she's not, a, she's not entirely for all of these raids that are throwing families apart from one another. And the other thing was that she says that uh, she's against illegal immigrants um, and, and does not want refugees to come if we do not know their intentions. Now, to me, that could read that any refugee from these war-torn countries should not be allowed, or one could see it as her saying that some refugees could be allowed if we can accurately vet them. Yeah, that was, she kind of put those two things back to back, kind of, it was all, it was all intermixed, so it was hard to distinguish between what she really meant, like, should we not allow refugees, any refugees, because we don't know their intentions, but then allow immigrants from other countries who we have vetted. It was, the way she worded it was weird um, to me. But also I thought when she was speaking about in immigration, it was interesting because she did speak so much about how her family like found this opportunity in America. Um, and I thought that was interesting with her attitude towards refugees. Yes, and as we've seen throughout the Republicans, the Republican Party, regardless of which part of the spectrum, there is more or less this uniform attitude, and it doesn't seem to have to do anything to do with background. It's just, if they're from this mindset, they, and it's part of, I think it all goes back to them being strong and w more or less on the hawkish side compared to Democrats who are more willing to allow these people in. But one, a few things she did say, which I did question, were that she said that the uh, um, Affordable Care Act has caused insurance costs to rise, Obama's, which m may be technically true. However, Obama said that the infl health care inflation has decreased, and it, it is fact that we have had the slowest decrease in health insurance, slowest increase in health insurance costs since the Affordable Care Act has taken place. Um, we have, and then she said that we are facing the biggest terrorist threat since 9-11 and that Obama can't deal with it. Many scholars believe that President Bush ultimately created this, the Islamic State by allowing a powder keg to develop in the Middle East. And Obama explicitly in the speech called, which he has before, for an authorization of military force against the Islamic State. So I don't think it's she's, she's appropriate in saying that he can't deal with it. He's trying. It's Congress. Yeah, I agree. And it was also pretty fitting that she kind of called out the Islamic State as this great threat, the greatest threat, terrorist threat since 9-11, when Obama just previously in his speech talked about how you know, equating, like, the Islamic State saying that they're this great threat to America just plays into their rhetoric. So mm -hmm. it's pr it was pretty expected, I think. Yes, and one last note before we go, that is the economy. Obama touted the economy not nearly as much as I thought he would, but we have had the strongest two years of job growth since 1998 to 2000, and we had 292,000 jobs in the in the jobs uh, from the December jobs report, and he said 14 million people have... I have gotten jobs, and I imagine he means since the economic recovery started with his stimulus plan. Was there anything about his re the lack of remarks or his lacks on the his remarks on the economy that surprised you, or did you expect him to say any more of it? I was surprised. Yeah, I was surprised by how little he talked about those specific facts and figures because he kind of started with that, and then he moves right into in order to keep this up and prepare people for jobs. We need to give them ev education. We need to give them health care. So he did, he kind of used it more as like a segue into, I think, those policies than focus on the, re the reports and the specifically economic factors of the economy. I would agree with that. He was using his positive statistics for putting out policy proposals in his plan for the future. Mm -hmm. Well, from Studio C, from the USA Amherst School for Communication and Journalism, thank you for watching us on what this is, my last State of the Union recap and analysis. I'm Max Schwartz. And I'm Allie Main. Thank you for joining us. We will be back on February 1st for Iowa caucus coverage.